Black Friday Morning Rando. Greetings and welcome to the Friday Morning Nameless. I'm Chad the Alcoholic. And today we have a, a brand new Neil. Uh, we, have a, <laughs> we have another, uh, our third Rando uh, conversation. And I'm very excited because actually I... I actually am very unfamiliar with this dude, and um, I think it'd be, I'm very excited, I'm as excited as you are to understand who this guy is, and so, um, so, it's funny, because, Neil, my, my wife was asking me, so, like, you having a com- another conversation with Neil, <laughs> who, I said, no, this is another Neil, and she's like, oh, so, Neil, I said, yeah, Neil with an I, yeah, uh, yes. like, Neil, so, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I have I have been a lurker in the corner since probably it has existed. I've been exclusively a lurker. I do not comment. I do not chat. I'm nothing. And then you started asking for randos, and I was like, "Oh, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it." And then the first one was Neil, and you kept saying, "Thank you, Neil." for coming and doing this. I was like, it's, if I, I've listened to Grim Grizz enough to know that a synchronicity should be followed all the way through. So I was like, I guess I have to be the next Neil. And then <laughs> Paul started doing conversations with another Neil and like a Neil would come up in like all the time. People would just kept saying the name, Neil, Neil, Neil. I was like, okay, I'm in. It's like, uh, it's like a relevance realization or something like that. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, uh, well, tell me about your story, man. Like that's fascinating to me. That so you've been an exclusive lurker. Yes, yeah. Which is, I think, like a a, a feat of discipline that I can't imagine. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. How do you do that? And then also just yeah, just go wherever you want. I'm going to do my best to just listen because I have this terrible uh, habit of. Blah, 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 blah. Me, 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 me. So I'm just going to listen. Yeah. Go. Okay. So first of all, technically not an exclusive lurker. There's like maybe five comments that I've done in the past like couple of weeks since I put this meeting on the calendar. So I will take credit as Parku Parku. That is me. Uh, but anyway, technically it, this is not my first appearance, but it is my first in-person appearance. So I uh, kind of fell into the corner through Jordan Peterson, not surprising. Um, I what did kind of an alcoholic speed run. Um, I was an alcoholic from 17, well, I guess still an alcoholic, but I was, I was drinking from age 16 to 22. Uh, and I came out uh, of alcoholism into sobriety in 2017, which is a very auspicious year in this corner of the internet. Uh, and I did it. I didn't really know what my life was before becoming sober. You know, I'm going to take off these headphones. Actually, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm. I am hearing myself too much. Oh, <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, so I got sober and then discovered Jordan Peterson. I was like, this is perfect. This is the kind of, uh, like a message that I need right now. But at the time I was like, I guess agnostic would probably be the best way to describe myself. No, I was probably more of an atheist. I think I wore the label atheist. Like, I do not believe in God. I believe there is no God. Uh, And uh, Jordan Peterson kind of opened the window to like, maybe I can pretend there is a God. (laughs) Uh, So I started trying to pretend that there was a God. Uh, And at this time, I was also listening to like uh, Brett Weinstein, and Benjamin Boyce were like kind of like floating in my periphery. Um, 
And there was once upon a time a conversation between Benjamin Boyce, Jonathan Pajot, and Paul Vanderclay. Mm. And that is when I fell down the Paul Vanderclay rabbit hole, mm. just consuming probably an unhealthy amount of YouTube content. <laughs> uh, and then yeah, here I am. Uh, over the those years, I also ended up joining the Orthodox Church. Um, and I have been Orthodox now for a year. And Is that's that it. Uh, there's a, like a lot that I can talk about myself, but I, I don't know what to say so so if you have questions feel free to to ask the questions because i don't know where to start so um so no, are you, you, you. oh ah uh, you, you took your headphones off you took your headphones off do, 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 yeah, do. I but I also unplugged them, so it should have oh. given me the sound. <laughs> but then you plug them back in and they work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Well, I guess you'll have to carry the burden of listening to yourself once I in a suppose, while. I suppose. I suppose. This is the uh, this is the 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 painful luxuries of life is listening to the things to me <laughs> going through my own head. Mm -hmm. Um. So okay, so you've been at in the Orthodox Church now for a year. Are you mm -hmm. um, uh, what do they call that? A, a cat catechumen? Uh, uh, no, I've been. I was um, chrismated a year ago, so that's when oh. you like enter into the church. So it's actually been a two years that I've been kind of like in that world. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious about about. Um, let's say um, we'll we'll get to that that experience of what it was like. Um, uh, let's say making the decision to do to to seek Christ, and then what it's been like that unfolding of of the what has, you, has your spiritual awakening uh, been like? Let's say mm -hmm. so. I'm interested in that, but um, let's go back to um, uh, and I'll, I'm also very interested in in what um, how you decided to to um, that you were alcoholic and then um mm -hmm. and then how, how you you know how that whole thing went and if you if you are in a 12-step program i prefer that you do not say that so um you know uh that's why actually why i wear the mask because mm -hmm. of, of certain traditions in the in aa mm -hmm. and and so i'm kind of foolish so i wear the mask to 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 adhere to a particular um uh, suggested tradition of anonymity. Mm -hmm. Although I'd love to have this thing off, I just I try to I try to submit to the principles of mm -hmm. uh, 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 that are that are suggested. So that's one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll go there. I'm interested in knowing about your alcoholism and sure. uh, let's go let's go back. Let's do the old PVK. Uh, okay, let's okay. pretend like PVK is running the show here. <laughs> Tell me about. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your upbringing. Okay, so my dad was in the Navy for 25 years. Um, and But I didn't have kind of the typical like military brat experience. He was stationed in one place for the first 11 years of my life, and then he retired. So... Um, that is, and then we grew, I grew up going to like a non-denominational, like kind of fundamentalist, very literal interpretation of the Bible, kind of like pretty much Baptist church. Um, and that kind of shaped my understanding of like God and spirituality and everything. It was very like. rules but not it's hard to say because like as an orthodox christian now there's like a lot of like rules way more than i grew up with but on the other hand there's like a lot fewer expectations i guess like um culturally i don't know it's hard to describe like the, if 
so many people in the corner are like ex-evangelical, ex-fundamentalist, like, you know what I'm talking about. It was very typical, very typical growing up. And then my dad retired from the Navy and we moved from Virginia to Indiana for him to attend a theological seminary to become a mm. pastor. So uh, then we started going to a different kind of church. And like the 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 fact that there were different kind of churches, like I was 11. So like I kind of understood like people do things differently, but this was like people do things way different and still get to be called Christian. This doesn't make sense because, you know, growing up, it was very much like this is the way. And then it's like, oh, no, there's a lot of other ways and they're all fine, apparently. And that was hard for me to wrap my head around. But I, you know, I just, you know, went along with it. It's like, okay, sure. We can view everything differently and every, it's all the same. Okay, I gotcha. Um, so then my dad became a pastor and now I'm a pastor at, you know, I think it was 16 when I became a pastor's kid. And it's like, <laughs> I'm not, I am not ready for this. Um, you know, talk about expectations, you know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, I, I sort of knew how to play guitar. So like I became the youth worship leader. You know, that's just like the path that right. my life was on. I was just like, very passively following the path. And it's like, okay. And then the path led to, okay, now you're going to go to like a Christian college. Good. We live in a town with one of those. It's so easy to just follow the path. Uh, but at the time, I also got a job washing dishes at a local restaurant. Uh, and then I became a chef at that local restaurant, like a cook. And I got exposed to alcohol and all sorts of other things that come along with uh, <laughs> late late night drinking. Um, and I had a girlfriend and stuff. And I was, it was just like following this like very scripted path. I am not into that. I'm going to rebel. I became and then I just, you know, I just switched over to the rebellious pastor skid archetype uh kind of semi-consciously i was you know i was a pretty self-conscious teenager i was like okay yeah i know that this is very typical but i'm just gonna lean into it and just accept that no one has like choices you just do what you're programmed to do like i was totally an npc like to this day i'm like Am I still just an NPC? I don't mm. know. I do not know. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I totally believe in free will and everything, but I so, also, yeah. No, this is good. This is good because I, I was thinking about um, how I think I think a lot of kids in general have this NPC quality where, because obviously mm -hmm. the world is very big and it's, way too much to manage uh and you know we i think a lot of us even if our parents aren't as great as we would like them to be we still have this idealized version of or this kind of like comic book character of mom and dad are kind of like superman and wonder woman mm -hmm. and, and and there's like this odd um dissident trust that they will do what they should do and then as we grow older we realize they aren't doing what i want them to do somehow and mm -hmm. what is wrong with them but like not in like this it's it's not a conscious for me it wasn't anyways mm -hmm. a conscious discovery of they're screwing up it was like things were being shredded as time goes and, and it, mm -hmm. became, it actually was a, a normal piece of the fabric that all of that disintegration was normal in some mm -hmm. sense um so i'm i'm curious about the time when you are uh, 0 to 11 you have this fundamental upbringing like 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, and then, and then like the world, the world starts to shift and mm-hmm. it's like, well, like you said, and, and like, just like, so you, you the frames were being broken for you as mm-hmm. time was going on. Yeah. Um, do, would you say, would, would you say, um, that you had, uh, like a particular kind of silent fear that you couldn't address somehow, like, like, um, I don't know how to put that. Uh, like, Oh, something's happening, but I can't really, did you ask questions? Were you, were you uh, mm-hmm. vocal about these uncertainties and things like this, or was it just M- MPC all the way down? Um, I would say, I mean, I don't think I vocalized them like, audibly but i was asking myself like it always seemed to me like everyone knew what they were doing and i didn't know right. what i was doing like i was like trying to yeah trying to make things work the way I saw them work for everyone like the the experience I saw of everyone else's life looked very different from my internal experience Mm -hmm. like my internal experience was very much like I think like fear of um being just being (laughs) fear of being like I and this really played into my alcoholism of just like I don't like the the way that I am yeah Uh, I don't I don't feel like I'm doing anything real I don't feel like I'm doing anything right Mm. and uh so I would rather not feel that way. I would right. pref- I prefer to feel nothing or like the 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 confidence of alcohol is like insane. Like Yeah, yeah. It could take me from feeling terrified and mm-hmm. not being able to articulate that. Yeah. To just being average. Yeah. And that miracle. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then we can go right past that too. I feel better, yeah. than her, you yes. know. And the yeah, manage to stay here mm-hmm. or here. I just have to. It's always yeah. Bl- yeah. Um. So, like, like one way I I would describe it is fear. I think characterized my entire fabric of mm-hmm. who I. Um, and and I I did not know that because it's like a fish swimming in water. You're like. You know, I don't know I'm in water, but like I'm constantly in fear. And um, looking back, I can see that I was one of the things I was probably most afraid of was being afraid. Mm-hmm. I was afraid of being afraid, and 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 the problem with that is I was constantly afraid. <laughs> so, and, and the way I I would say call that today is um, I would call that uh, a spiritual malady, mm-hmm. or the words a spiritual illness or a separation between me and my fellows and me and whatever God that they're talking about that they seem to be able to access and, and, mm-hmm. and, and feel love from, but I can't, you know, cause like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And so, and then I realized once I drank, like the first drinks, the first time I got felt the effect of alcohol, I realized these bastards were lying. Right, I'm like you yeah. guys lied to me. This makes me feel more like a person than anything has. Mm-hmm. What you guys are are saying that's what God does, mm-hmm. right? You guys are saying God, God will help you feel like a, the person that you had hoped to always be. Yeah. But I found it's an alcohol, and I'm just terrified of God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I neatly evaded God for a very long time. Um. So this is what you're saying that's your discovery that once you find alcohol, it's like you bastards hid this from me or yeah. something like. Oh that. yeah, definitely. And also, like my dad was an alcoholic, and oh. he he was sober my entire life. Um, 
but we were raised like alcohol is evil oh it sure will, it is dangerous and it will steal your life away and then you get drunk for the first time you're like no it won't it's right, awesome right. <laughs> right. and even if it does it might be worth it yes yeah 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 so that was my first forays into alcohol and then i uh i became a chef like that was my a purpose in life became like being the best at that and i got very good i'm at my peak i was probably in the top one percent of line cooks wow like in the country i believe uh, uh, I was working, uh, eventually I moved to Chicago for a culinary school and was working in a, uh, a very well-respected restaurant uh, and just like totally miserable, like the most miserable I've ever been in my life. But I was like super good. And I was carrying, I was carrying a team of people on my back every night and that felt awesome. Yeah. Uh, and I was also, you know, just plastered every night. And yeah. Uh, you know, smoking marijuana all the time. I was definitely, there's like two tracks as a chef. You can go like uppers to get you through, or you can go downers to cope with <laughs> having right. gotten through, or you can do both. Um, and I was more of a downers to like forget the stress. Um, so that, and uh, you know, I started taking Xanax with alcohol and just like, I mean, it's it's a, if you want to experience oblivion, that will do it. But right. then you come back to reality, and it's very painful. Yeah, the, yeah. The problem with oblivion is it always you always have to wake up the next day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I recently watched the show The Bear mm -hmm. with my uh, she, by her suggestion. She's actually we were just talking about the bear. She's worked in the restaurant industry her um, her whole adult life. It's where I first met mm -hmm. her, and she describes. She says, "Oh yeah, this is this is what it's like." I don't know if you've seen that show. I saw the first two episodes and it was really very real, uh, <laughs> and I was like, "I don't, I don't know if I'm like healed enough <laughs> to do it." Because <laughs> uh, you know, if I was if I was still in it, then I would just like love it. I'm sure, yeah. like. But I've kind of, I've distanced myself a little bit from that world. Uh, and now I don't, I don't know if I want to like see it. Because there's a lot of me that's like, I miss the the, the chaos that is also like, create. it's creative chaos like all the time. It's, uh, it's a, it's like a totally different world. Like yeah. you don't live in the same world as people working nine to fives. Like it's just not the same. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I, I yeah. So I'm, I, I think that's interesting. We have something in us that. So I would say that uh, I've I've always felt like the, like I was a seeker mm -hmm. of some sort. Like that's why I drank because it helped me make me feel connected. Mm -hmm. I don't think I drank to escape. I think in the end, I would have told you that I was, I would have had this, this story about how I, I drank to escape, but upon further review, I'm like, no, I didn't drink to escape because I knew there was no escape. Mm -hmm. I drank to get connected, but help me yeah. feel connected. And, um, and then even after all the years of being just, uh, uh, separated from alcohol and then finding a, a spiritual, or, or having a relationship with God and then mm -hmm. being able to see the world and my, myself in it in a more a more accurate light. Um, I, I still, I, I, I can't afford to, to believe that there isn't part of me that still is attracted to that chaos. Mm -hmm. I, I, I well, The first time I experienced that, um, I was like, I don't know, six years sober or something. Mm -hmm. And, there's this show that was on Netflix called The Dirt, which is about Motley Crue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I didn't want to watch the show because I'm like, whatever, I'm, I don't really care. But one day I, I started watching it, and there's a scene 
in there where Nikki Six is in the the clo- He's sitting in the closet of this big mansion. Mm-hmm. He has all the money and everything he ever wanted, and he's sitting there hiding in his closet from whatever perceived thing is going on to him. Mm-hmm. And he's toying with the idea. He has this pistol, and he's toying with a particular idea. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching this at six years sober and this little voice in me was like, Oh, that sounds great. Right. There's, so there's, I still know that there's, 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 there's still spirits within me that, that want me to notice that stuff. And and Mm -hmm. it will try to try to tell me that that's fun, you know? And so, yeah, that's why I think, um, I can never really afford to fall asleep at the wheel um, mm-hmm. as it relates to to uh, seeking God and, and, and trying to be and trying to, to be the man God would have me be and serve as he would have me serve. Because I think like I was talking to somebody this morning about it, the service aspect of it, like mm-hmm. kind of what we're doing right now. And then or in, in AA, I, I'd like to uh, I work with others, not because I'm a good guy, but because. Mm-hmm. Because that's the air that I get to breathe. And if I don't, I'm screwed, man. So, um, yeah, I think that's interesting. Like, yeah, it's a, probably good intuition to, to not want to watch the bear. I bring it, I only brought it up because I thought anybody who might be watching this, if they're wondering what that world is like, mm-hmm. watch that show. And, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And that, and that guy deals with the main character in that show deals with alcoholism peripherally. Mm-hmm. His family is alcoholic, and so yeah. he ends up going to like Alan. So, mm-hmm. okay, so yeah, tell me more of your story about uh, what what Chicago and this was like. Okay, so uh, I end up moving home after a a night uh, where I. Uh, what my life was saved <laughs> by triangle head screws on the window. Like if I had been able to take the window down and open it, I would have jumped. Like I was <laughs> so ready to to just be done, to exit. Um, so I didn't. <laughs> Uh, and I managed to fall asleep. And when I woke up, I called my dad and moved home. Uh, and you would think that that would be the moment when I got sober, but it wasn't. Uh, I just moved back home, started working at the same restaurant where I got my start. Uh, kind of, I worked my way up to being the executive chef at that restaurant and drank the whole time uh and you know drove home drunk every night and uh was like okay now it's manageable <laughs> i found the the environment was the problem not me right not yeah, the the alcohol um and now i get you know i was kind of a a small fish in a big pond in Chicago. And now I get to be a big fish in a very small pond. Nice. Uh, and my ego was insane. I was out of control, selfish and full of myself and just sure that like it, it would last forever as you know like even though existence is painful at least i can feel really good about what i'm doing and like people will at least think that i'm i've got my life together because i'm I'm hot shit in this town but not really also not really like (laughs) <laughs> no one no one actually cares about me. No one I'm not like getting rid up rid up in the paper or anything. It's just, you know, in my world, I was yeah. I was B. And that felt good. Um and yeah. 
and then I got married. Uh, I have only I this my girlfriend from moving out of my parents' house uh, at seventeen. Like we've been together for eleven years. Uh, so we got married in twenty sixteen, um, and then my alcoholism really just just got completely out of control. Um, I think because I was like, marriage is a huge deal. And I had no idea. Right. Like what it really meant at all. Like I had no idea what being married was. I had no idea what like creating a family was. And it means that you have to sacrifice yourself to that thing. You had to submit like, a hundred percent of you to like being that a new person in a new thing. Uh, and I was not ready to be that. Uh, and I'm like, so lucky <laughs> that I, well, no, I'm not lucky. I'm very, I'm very grateful to God that the, the woman I married is the woman I married because otherwise like I probably would, I don't know. I don't know. It would be much different. Uh, but because, so, hang on a yeah. so you so you were with this gal for since 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 you were a, uh, a kid yet? Yeah, since I was a, a dishwasher in wow. this in narrative. Flow. And so she followed you to Chicago and this. Uh, she did. She didn't move to Chicago with me. I was. Okay. She was eventually probably going to, but she didn't at the time. I, I'm a speed runner. I, I was in Chicago, like young and naive and optimistic and suicidal and back home in like the span of less than a year. And I also Perfect. was like, you know, top dog at this rest, not top dog, but you know, I was, yeah. you know, getting noticed at this restaurant, like immediately, and you know, so yeah, I it, it, everything moved very quickly, uh, and then I, you know, it was just like this cycle back to the beginning. Yeah, uh, but yeah, my wife was my wife was my girlfriend for that entire time. Wow, and, and yeah, so wow. So what 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 like approaching marriage? Or making the decision to marry her, like, what, do you remember? Um, I don't know. Maybe I don't want to dig too much because mm -hmm. it might be it might be too personal. But mm -hmm. uh, when 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 making the decision to to ask her to marry you, what was um, what was kind of going through your mind? I like I like that you said. Well, you had no idea mm -hmm. that it would be what it is because I, I i didn't either i actually mm -hmm. never wanted to get married <clears throat> um i was one of those those people who thought that marriage is just a piece of paper what's the big mm -hmm. deal um <clears throat> for me it wasn't actually until peterson mm -hmm. uh, until um well I, I had this whole series of really bad decisions in so-called dating which mm -hmm. wasn't dating yeah. um uh, where i i had reached the point like I had many times before um, uh, kind of suicidal mm -hmm. um, and that was in sobriety. Uh, so like my bad behavior in sobriety brought me to a very low point and I made a decision that I couldn't do this so-called dating anymore. So I had to personally do something. Complete. I had to make a decision to, to live by principles and have boundaries that I would mm -hmm. adhere to. Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't uh I wouldn't step on uh, I wouldn't choose people I wouldn't choose a partner based on their boundaries I mm -hmm. had my boundaries and I'm going to do what I should do and then I'm going to be honest and that that's what led to to my marriage but I I wasn't going to marry anybody uh because it was just a piece of paper and then one mm -hmm. one of these days I was listening to Peterson in the the Genesis series and he talked about um, I think it might have been Genesis 1, the first video or the second video, he talks about uh, 
some friends that he had who has a wedding ceremony with these candles. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen that video. Um, Probably. Yeah. yeah and, and so. like, but in that, um, that, that completely blew my mind. And I was like, Oh, that's what marriage is. Mm-hmm. And, and like, and, it was it was in that moment where I, I made the decision that I was going to ask him to marry me. Mm-hmm. Again, not knowing, because I'm just a Western idealist dork. You know, yeah, like yeah. You know, I live in Disneyland, and it's going to be great. And then you get married, yeah. and you realize I am so selfish. Yes, yeah. Uh-huh. I can't begin to plan for how selfish. I can I can make plans about how a nice guy I'm going to be and how great she's going to be and this and that and then you mm-hmm. start to run up against the reality of I'm Chad and Chad with people is very 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 hard so mm-hmm. that has been a, a, a an adventure but so how, how what was it like for you what prompted you to ask her mm-hmm. and then uh, and then yeah go on you can go on from there and just tell me about maybe what it's like to be a husband and, and this and that. Um, well, part of why I asked her was because like, my dad's a pastor <laughs> and like, there's enough, like, like love for my dad that I wanted to like follow that kind of expectation and like fit into his life uh, and his frame, like as like a couple, you know. So I wanted to like do the thing that would like make, you know, my family hold together um, Mm -hmm. uh, and not have to like just exist in this world of like, we'll pretend we don't do what you know what we're doing. Uh Like I, I was very uncomfortable with like that. Um, And then there was another part of me that like, desperately wanted children which is weird uh like but i grew up as one of six um so like that has kind of become uh, has always been just like my ideal life is to like have kids uh and my wife wanted to have kids and like getting married there was enough programming left in me that was like you must be married before you have kids for the sake of the children uh so that was part of it and there's another part that's just like um even though i didn't understand any like spiritual significance to marriage there's something meaningful about it like that i couldn't describe at all that was like i should we should be married so and then there was another part that was like, I'm, I I asked her to marry her to me uh, shortly before moving from Chicago back home. So it was a very bad time in my life. And part of asking her to marry me was like, save me <laughs> from right. this. Uh, and like, very selfishly, like, you can fix my life, right? <laughs> please uh so that's how i was thinking about marriage at the time uh and it's some by some miracle we're still married out of that so yeah beautiful okay well <laughs> and so and now all the time when you come back are you still attending your father's church uh no i don't know i i it's it's a a difficult time to remember uh i i don't think so um i didn't really i moved out when i was 17 and i don't think i went back to my dad's church like ever even when i was entering like rethinking Christianity I was like no I'm not ready for that were you were you um 
did you have a, any sort of falling out with him or was it where had you always been able to maintain relationship and how mm. how was he able to um bridge the gap with you yeah um we didn't ever have like a, a falling out per se. I, this is just like the way that I operate relationally is very like, if I don't see you, I don't care. <laughs> like, uh, I put zero effort into any relationship ever in my whole life um so when i moved out it was as if like they didn't exist so it wasn't there wasn't like a dramatic like blow up or like i, I was never like a black sheep i could always go home at any time i just most of the time did it uh and yeah when i moved back from Chicago it was like countdown till I can figure out somewhere else to live so I don't have to be here mm -hmm. uh, but not because I like hated them it was just like I like my own stuff mm -hmm. uh, but then yeah getting sober you know there have been a few uh, like that's the the there are two like primary relationships that were healed through getting sober one was obviously my wife and then uh my father so yeah we'll get into that okay yeah so yeah you could I, i'm kind of at a loss where to go so you just go wherever you'd like okay to so i guess we'll just we'll do when i got sober okay yeah uh so i and working in this restaurant and like doing it just like the grind and just letting alcohol control my existence. Um and up up until we got married, my wife really had no idea how much of a problem alcohol was for me. Mm -hmm. I was uh I wasn't like hiding it. I just was a very uh I was a functional guy. Like, I, I just was like normal. I, I was. I think I was just drunk so much that she had no idea like what the levels of drunkness were. Yeah. For me, uh, she it's a common yeah. thing, by the way, that mm -hmm. people. Um, uh, there are many people I know in in recovery who their family members will say, "Why are you in AA? You're not an alcoholic." And they're yeah. like. Yeah, well, you have no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that hiding. It was, I was just, that's how I existed. And you just couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So at the time, she was a, a kindergarten teacher. And I was working the dinner shift. So we would, like, almost never see each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, you know, stay out and come home. And, like, I was drunk when I got home. And then I would do drugs and drink a bottle of gin and then crash like totally oblivious next to her like that. And she noticed that. Of course. <laughs> uh, she definitely noticed that. Uh, and she kind of laid down an ultimatum, like you're going to get sober or I'm going to move out. And I was like, I'm not ready to get sober. And then she moved out. Um, and that was like the what what affected me was like how I could not care. Like, why would I make that choice? Why would I do that? Like, I should just say, okay, I'm done. And then, like, at least give it an attempt. But I just, like, people talk about uh, 
demons a lot. But I don't think they, a, a, not a lot of people have been possessed and know right. it. Um, well, actually, I think a lot of people have been possessed. Wrong. A lot of people have. But not a lot of people can, like, understand that they were. Right. Or are. Um, but, like, looking back, I was 100% controlled. Like, I, my will was gone. It was not my own. <laughs> right. Uh, it was completely, I was completely controlled by all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was like the moment, not, she didn't like wake me up. It was like, the, the reaction I had to that was just like, it was so like soul crushing <laughs> to realize that I would like consciously, I consciously chose alcohol. <laughs> That's and then you realize that you've become a person who would do that and yeah. would do it gladly. Like I was happy. I was like, now I don't have to change. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now you are in my way. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. And then, yeah, I had that too. And then when other people are around, <laughs> I could put, I could put on an act for other people. Mm -hmm. And cause I had a similar situation uh, early on in my, alcoholism or somebody left and i would just i would i think secretly i was like you're saying i was like yes mm -hmm. i like to do what i want <clears throat> but then publicly i would mm -hmm. be like morose and like self-effacing like oh, i can't believe that i can't get it together or whatever it is mm -hmm. <clears throat> or blame the other person or something and uh but yeah go ahead sorry Okay, so then I, I had planned like months ago. I had planned to go to New York to do like a a stage, is what it's called, um, but it's basically an unpaid internship at like one of the best restaurants in the world, uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns in New York. So I like drove out there, and I had to be sober to drive to New York from India. And then when I got there, I was like, well. Okay, I'm sober now. I I might as well just do this for a little while, uh, trying to be sober. Um, and you know, I hadn't been like it takes. I don't know how many hours it takes to drive from Indiana to New York, but in those hours, I had consumed no alcohol and the you know leading up to leaving i i had been asleep so it was like the longest stretch of time that i hadn't had like even a sip of alcohol this um, is i don't know is it better i don't know <laughs> i don't know but I'm, I, I have this streak, so I should keep going. Um, and then I got to where I was staying and I prayed um, for probably the first real time I had prayed. Um, and I didn't know, like my understanding of God was still very like man in the sky i you know i was an atheist in the like sam harris sense uh you know i bought into that like description of god like that's who people believe in uh and like so i was like okay i guess i'll ask the, the man in the sky to help me uh and like I just felt like <laughs> that was the right thing to do, and I did it. Uh, and I have been sober since then. Uh, 
So miracles are real. Mm -hmm. And, but like, again, you would think, you would think that would be the time when I had my spiritual awakening and I would begin believing in something and having faith. Uh, but no, I was like, that's what a wild coincidence that I'm so good at being sober. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was so stupid uh, to think that I had anything to do with it. Well, I had like a, the the grain of mustard, like the the mustard seed is so true. Like it really, like you have almost nothing to do with any miracles that happen, but you do have to have like the grain. Yep. Um, That's the grain is, I think it's just willingness, mm -hmm. merely willingness. That is all. Like, yeah. I'm just willing to do to mm -hmm. That's it. just have my eyes open. Maybe, maybe yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I can't keep them open, but I'm willing to have them open. Mm -hmm. Please mm -hmm. keep them. Open. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, so then I'm sober and then I'm like, okay, what do I do with my life? So I finished off this stash. I actually left a week early because I was like, I called my wife and was like, I actually may have texted her just because I am, I was afraid. I was extremely afraid. I was like, I've been sober this whole time. Will you be at our house when I get, if I come? And she said, yes, which is like another miracle. Like that is insane. Yeah. That she would say yes. Yeah. So then I drove home. Uh and I like had quit the restaurant job to go like basically that I was hoping that this dodge would turn into a job and we I would live in New York and like a whole new life. It's like, no, you're gonna have a whole new life. Back at home, again, you're like, where you grew up is where you are going to stay. <laughs> I had fought that for so long, but now I, I'm accepting that. Uh, but so I quit the restaurant job and started working uh, at a farm. And I just got my, my hands dirty every day. And I woke up in the morning instead of at noon. And I, uh, yeah, I was, it was very, it was kind of like a it, kind of permaculture-y, like sustainable agriculture kind of place. And uh, like getting connected to the land was so awesome. And being with like animals, like I split my time half in the garden and half doing animal chores and I would just like walk with the cows and just like feel a, a, a quiet way of life for the first time uh, since I had been like an adult um, probably ever actually mm -hmm. just like being Connect. It was connection. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It was a hundred percent connection. Is what I was feeling. I was totally going to blur out connected. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry. Go no ahead. No words. Yeah. Yeah. And I was so unused to it, um, but it was just like the best thing. Uh, but they didn't pay very well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is a, I wish I had not cared. <laughs> Part of me wishes I had just not cared that they didn't pay me very well. Uh, but I was still looking for something that would make me, you know, you never really stop wanting to be rich and famous. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's something that's actually kind of something that has kind of limited me to being a lurker. It's like I if I get a taste, what's it gonna do to me? <laughs> like if I if my name gets known to like five people, right? What is having those people like paying attention to me going to do to me? Uh, is is that going to like set off the next like thing? Like, am I going to become an an addict to another thing? Uh, which I mean, I already am. Like, I everyone's addicted to attention. It's like. the the way of the world now more than ever but so anyway not to get sidetracked on that too long but well that's it and what maybe we should talk about a little bit later about um uh, like what what might we be able to do to to stay rightly ordered because i think disciplines are huge mm -hmm. especially for undisciplined people i don't mean undisciplined in that I, I can wake up in the morning and go to work mm -hmm. and do all, mm -hmm. I do all that. I am spiritually undisciplined. Mm -hmm. I cannot. I have to really stretch myself. Uh, not because I want to, because I don't, mm -hmm. but because uh, because I don't suffer well pointlessly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. So continue. Yes, because I deal with this this thing, mm -hmm. this this attention game. This with mm -hmm. this. It's. it's It's not for the faint of heart, let's say, um, yeah. especially if you're well acquainted with your own selfish pro proclivity, proclivities and uh, self-centered self char character uh, character defects. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. continue, continue, please. Okay. So um, this is now, you know, it's 2017. I'm listening to Jordan Peterson. I'm listening to Joe Rogan was like, catch i was finally like catching basically when you're drunk like nothing matters but being drunk so i had no like awareness of what anyone was talking about i only cared about my own like inner experience i didn't really care what anyone was saying i didn't care about politics i didn't care about religion i didn't care about philosophy i didn't care about current events i cared about nothing <laughs> i cared about my life And making sure that I uh, was feeling the right way. Like I was managing my uh, uh, my buffer. Mm -hmm. like I would say that's, you know, that's, that was my experience, was just managing the buffer between me and everything else. Yes. Um, so then I'm like, oh, there's no buffers. My buffer is gone. Uh, and I start, like, listen, what's going on in this world that is so big? Uh, and, I, you know, I fell down a few rabbit holes. I didn't, you know, nothing crazy, but, you know, just you know, the general, like, internet zeitgeist kind of became the waters I swam in for a while. Uh, and Jordan Peterson was one of those people that kind of, like, became a like a black hole that just kind of like drew me in uh and i started thinking about i i never read the book i think i started it and i was like wait this is just all the things he said like but <laughs> it's, it's slower <laughs> i i i already listened to 1200 hours of jordan peterson why am i reading 12 rules right the footnotes the yeah. books are notes yeah it was yeah it was kind of i never read the book that's that was the point of that uh and but i started thinking seriously about like the meaning and purpose uh in a way that I had, I had never thought before. And I just started thinking about God in a way that I had never thought before. Like the whole God number one idea is very powerful. Um, when you accept that, 
and like huge doors open up and you're like, you know, understanding like what you are in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, you want to explain what that is just to maybe people yeah. who don't. Mm -hmm. God so one. God number one being uh, like the, the impersonal, like being that holds creation or like, you know, like is beyond everything and therefore like holds it all. And like you can, uh, you can experience God in a way that you, it, I don't know, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. So, so the way I'll see it is, um, it could be the way that I've experienced God, the God number one bit mm -hmm. is like, and the, uh, coincidences. Well, mm -hmm. they're not. It's just, yeah. This, yeah. Really, um, so mm -hmm. like God, God is, is uh, very much um, the arena of arenas. Mm -hmm. Yes. And God number two is the agent of agents. Yes. But really God is God number mm -hmm. one and God number two. Mm -hmm. It's yes. all of that. And, and, and we have a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of us in the way of being able to, to see God. Because mm -hmm. right? you have God number three is me. Mm -hmm. And and he likes to 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 and he he's a self-centered God. Yeah. And so he, he distracts himself from being able to interact or receive or or uh mm -hmm. see grace uh or care or he, he he's very very self-centered. So yeah, mm -hmm. he, he 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 becomes the God. Yeah. God number three is the me God. So I like right. that. I have you said that before? Because that's a no, really good one. I, 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 I love it. Very good. Okay. Uh I, I will think about that. Uh okay. So Jordan Peterson, I'm thinking about meaning, and I'm like, okay, let's find some meaning. And then I, I try to go to like normal church, like the same kind of churches that I had uh, left, basically left behind. Uh, so we end up going with my wife and I go to uh, her family's church for a while. And it's just like, this is the, the Ted talk in a rock show kind of church. And I'm like, take me out of here i do not like this at all i do not feel a sense of meaning or purpose <laughs> i am just like we're just saying nothing and then singing nothing i couldn't get like behind it at all mm -hmm. i it it was too much um it felt very much like the constructed best church experience for like a very um psychologized world where it's just like soothing and then there's like the the big like crescendos in the music and there's like the the soft keyboards that just like get you ready moldable yeah. moldable moldable and then pow 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 here <laughs> come the the points of the sermon and yeah. then and then there's the soft keys and now if you felt something come on down <laughs> like, uh, well i i, I don't of course i felt something you made me feel something right so i, I like I, I think that people can have an experience there it's very valuable mm -hmm. i'll just give my own little my own little beef with it yeah. is um being a musician and who is, I guess, somewhat of a music snob, mm -hmm. like I love the fact that there's drums. Yeah. But what I really don't like about the drums is that they're always behind a glass. Yes. A glass, and you can't hear them. It's and so like doesn't the make drums, any sense. It, it's like, where's the bass guitar and the drums, man? Mm -hmm. So all right, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. I totally agree with that. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm a very uneducated music snob. Mm. Uh, I, yeah, I, I like. We don't have to get into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
but I totally agree on the glass in front of the drums. It doesn't make sense. If you're going to have a, an instrument, it should be the instrument that you hear. <laughs> right. <laughs> but what's the point? Uh, so I react like really negatively to that. And I'm like, I can't even pretend that this is real. Like my goal, my goal was, okay, Jordan Peterson says, act as if you like believe that God exists. And that meant for me, like go to church and like pretend to like do that. And the key was I was pretending. Like I, in my brain, like I constructed a way forward that was like, you value the traditions and what they can bring to your life. It was like super like self-help. I feel like this is, I was also really into like Chris Williamson and all that like kind of thinking like how to yeah. improve yourself and like get better. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, this is a great way to get better is to like pretend that you believe something to get all the good things and none of the like cringe. That was right. my, that was my yeah. goal was uh, bring the bond. And will follow. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is true, I think. Yes. But it it's is. a pay attention to what you're pay attention to your gut in that situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So then I just like gave up because I was like, I can't even pretend to like believe this. It uh it was, you know, just it was too much cringe. And then uh, I which I, I admit, I admit that this is not a theological like argument. This is not like calling out these mm -hmm. churches. It's just like, it was an aesthetic preference, 100%. And I'm sorry to everyone who, Don't be. who gets stuff out of that. I did not, I could not do it. Well, here's, this is why I say pay attention to your gut, because mm -hmm. I think it's a valuable experience to go mm -hmm. and act as if, um, something will be revealed mm -hmm. and something was revealed that this wasn't the pattern mm -hmm. that, that God would have you in. And what I mean is God would have you in. Now he mm -hmm. may have whatever Jeff or Steve or Jane or Jack, whatever. And, and those people might be able to, to bring the body and the mind will follow and they'll be able to follow, fall into the church there. Mm -hmm. But um, you were to, you came, you brought the body, the mind followed and it decided that this isn't the place. It just is not the place for me. Yeah. I need something different. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Like, it is. I it is. don't really throw, like, go go to Joel Olstein's church. Mm -hmm. You know, go to the Unitarian church. Go to the Universalist church. Do whatever. Like, I want to encourage people to <clears throat> outgrow their prejudice. And, and, and if you go and you find that that's for you, great. Mm -hmm. And if you go and you find that's not for you, great. Find the next one. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. So then I so I'm actually right now in a coffee shop. Uh it's closed. Don't worry. I'm not bothering anyone. Uh, <laughs> but at this very coffee shop, at this very bar where I'm sitting, I was sitting there reading a like a novel, and in walks a priest in like black <laughs> robes. I've never seen a priest in my life. And here he is sitting next to me. And he just like asked me what I was reading. And I was like, it's this book, uh, Survivor by Chuck, whatever, Palaniac. Uh, and, you know, we started talking about it. And he, and he, he was asking me about my life. And then we were talking about my family. And then, you know, it was just like, uh, he's, I'm a big fan of my priest. He's, one of, spoilers, he is my priest now. <laughs> uh, but he has a way of just like seeing people like, and just like, he loves them. Mm -hmm. And I felt that like immediately. And he handed me a card and was like, if you ever feel like it, go ahead and come to this church. 
and like in my brain i was like that's i don't like church i'm not gonna go to another one but in my heart i was like a hundred percent uh so then i went and like i like got i like dressed nice <laughs> and i was like why am i dressing nice uh and i i like said goodbye to my wife and she was like why are you even doing this you're not gonna like it and this is not the kind of person you are and i was like i know i know that i don't know why i'm doing it uh and i drove it's like half an hour away from my house and i drive there and i'm like a little bit early and i took a picture and sent it to my wife and i was like i'm here and she was like who are you how did you even like make yourself do this uh because i had been very like vocal about how i felt about church yeah uh, so it was a real shock and then i like walk in and someone greets me like it's like a, it's, it's an orthodox church and i expected i had no i had no expectations actually i had listened to some jonathan pejo but somehow my brain had blocked like the phrase orthodoxy and orthodox christian and orthodox church out of everything he ever said <laughs> like i had no i had no idea he was orthodox at all i had no idea what orthodoxy was i was like totally like this is my first ever experience i like walk in and it smells awesome this is awesome uh and i like i like stood there are not uh there's not pews in my church there's just like rugs and you just like stand there through the whole service and uh there's two services and i was i was there like in the middle of the first one uh it's called orthros and it's like a, a prayer service so it's just like psalms and some hymns that are sung and uh like prayers and it was just like weird uh like if you've there's no instruments there's just like voices and you know they're being chanted by you know, just like normal people they look like normal people and but they're like unleashing the byzantine chant just, i can't do it so i would i wish that i could demonstrate what it sounds like but i can't i'm not very good at it uh but then uh so i just like kind of stand and someone comes up and is like hey you're new uh if you have any questions yeah i'm here uh, if you need me to answer any questions. Uh, and it, it turns out now he's my god brother. Fun fact. Uh, and then <laughs> then the the divine liturgy begins. And it is amazing. But also totally weird. Like every time there's singing going on, like the it's not the same like notation as western music so like everything's like a little bit off like the yeah. frequent like the frequencies are different so like right. like you can't the first time you hear it it just sounds weird like for, and you can't really describe why um but at the same time i'm like judging it and i'm like these guys aren't that good at singing they're like good at they're like good at singing but they're not like that good and it's kind of you know and then it comes to the epistle and at the epistle uh someone like reads but it's sung so it's like from the the new testament and i just i was like what how why would you read the words but sing them i just didn't get it and it was really difficult but i was like entranced uh and then there's the gospel 
is read in the same way. And Father Matthew comes out. That's his name. I guess I dropped his name now. Uh, and gives a sermon. And it's about the the woman with the the I forget how they say it. It's like the the problem of blood for 18 years or whatever. And yes. she like reaches out and like touches yeah. Jesus Christ's garment. And powerful. So powerful. And the the it was not like a normal sermon that I had ever heard. He just like he connected everything that I was thinking about. Like for the past 10, uh, I don't know how many years. And just like, here you go. You're ready to touch the rope uh, and be healed. Uh, that's like, that was my, what I got out of that. Uh, and I, he didn't say those words, obviously. Like he wasn't speaking just to me, but like the Holy Spirit gave me the message. Let's <laughs> just do it. Uh, and then uh, there's a, a section of the liturgy called uh, the Grand Entrance. Like everyone like makes a path for them to come around and like walk with the 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 chalice that contains the blood of Christ with like a plate with the body of Christ. It's like covered and like they process through the, the church, the, all the, the, like the servers and the deacons and the priests, like they do that. And like right before that happens, there's this hymn called the Cherubic hymn. And it's the, the most glorious. <laughs> uh, but it's like, let us who mystically represent the cherubim and who sing the thrice holy hymn to the life creating Trinity, uh, let us now cast aside all earthly cares. And it's just like, just, I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> and I want to do that. And then, uh, there's another, after that, the pr procession, the, the priest stands and like does prayers for, he prays for like all these names that people had like given him to pray for. And he like says them. And it takes a while. because Sometimes there's a lot of names. Uh, and like throughout the, the liturgy, there's all these, they're called uh, litanies where he, someone will pray for like everything in the the whole world like and we respond lord have mercy and like that's just like the whole service is just like full of lord have mercy and then uh there's the the next after that happens then we move into I'm not, I don't know like the exact s steps of the liturgy, but eventually we get to this point where uh, the priest says uh, he's praying and he's thanking God for the, the liturgy that is like given to us, even though like there, it, the line is though there stand beside you, thousands of angels uh, thousands of archangels ten thousands of angels a seraphim cherubim soaring aloft on their wings six-winged many-eyed uh shouting proclaiming and saying holy 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 lord of sabaoth heaven and earth are full of thy glory and it like at that line like everyone joins and it's like wow <laughs> <laughs> i'm just like I don't understand why I've never done this. Like that was the feeling. Like why have I not been doing this my entire life? Why is this not 
like who I am. Uh, and then after that, it's like the part where uh, the priest, like, it's actually, he tells the Holy Spirit, transform this bread and wine into the body of Christ. And there's a line uh, in that section where he lifts up the chalice and he says, thine own of thine own, we offer up to thee on behalf of all and for all. And I'm just like breaking down. God, this is, <laughs> this is the, the only thing that matters in the whole world. Uh, and then there's some more things that happen. Uh, and then like the, the chalice comes out and the priests and the deacons are there and like people line up, like ready to take communion. And like, I know that I can't, like, I, I don't know a lot about Orthodox Christianity, but I knew that one thing was that I'm not allowed to get in the line, <laughs> but I just like sitting all like the furthest corner from anything. Uh, and I'm just like pulled, like, and I'm fighting. Like I, I didn't actually get in line and go, but I'm like, I have to, I mm. have to do this. Uh, and so, like, uh, the service is over, and then after, after everyone's taking communion, and there's like some more prayers. They like come out with a bowl of bread that's been blessed by the priest and he like puts it in your hand as you like everyone goes through the line and you can like get some bread. And the person who had like told me that if I had any questions, he sh I should ask him, he like taps me on the shoulder and is like, you're allowed to do this. You should get some bread. And it's like, oh, yes. And then I'm like the last person in line and the priest like puts it in my hand and says, I remember you. And like that just was like wow. awesome. Uh and then uh like afterwards, I'm just like this was so overwhelming and weird. So I just like hung out for a while and then uh the person who owns this coffee shop actually goes to this church, and that's why the priest was there, and he like saw me and be like did a little tour of all the icons and stuff. And then I was, just, you know, hanging out and another man came up to me who had, he's, uh, at the time he was just, uh, some, he, he, he was part of the service. He's now a subdeacon, but before he had not been ordained as a subdeacon, but, uh, and he co comes up to me and is like, so what did you think? It's like, I don't know what to think, but it was like the most incredible thing. And I'm definitely coming back. And he's like, well, let me send you home with five prayer books for you and your family. And if you, <laughs> if you want to give them away, you can do that. But here they are. Uh, and he like paid for them from the bookstore and like gave them to me. And all right. And he like, this is morning prayers. This is evening prayers. Pray them. It's like, okay, thank you for the actionable steps. Mm. Uh, and then I went home and told my wife, I think this is the church to go to. Mm. And we ended up going there. Uh, but that evening I was like, okay, I guess I'll do evening prayers. It's evening. Let me do evening prayers. And I did them. And then I was like, I have this feeling that I need to read the Bible. Also. So I've read the Bible and I'm like, what, what am I supposed to read? <laughs> so I like prayed that, yeah, I was like, just tell me what to read. And I read uh, John 21, which is like the end of the gospel of John, uh, where the the disciples are like fishing and Jesus is on the shore 
and he like calls them back and they like catch fish or something and they come back This is for the after the crucifixion. yes yes and the re the resurrection has happened and he's like appearing to them uh i don't think it's the first time but like he's there It's and the second like time. i yeah yeah It's the second time the fishing episode happens. mm -hmm. and they all come and peter who had denied christ three times uh is like conversing with jesus christ and jesus says do you love me and peter says of course i love you know and then jesus says uh care for my sheep and then like that repeats three times and i'm just like this is me i am peter <laughs> this is what is happening right now i'm being asked do you love jesus and my answer is yes and that has like insane implications And like, I was just, to I just kept reading it over and over and over. Like, Right. yes, I do. I do love Jesus. And I like, I ended up just like prostrating myself before God and saying, yes, whatever like you need from me, the answer is yes. And then I like this feeling of peace beyond understanding filled me and i was like okay <laughs> something just happened that i cannot explain with brain chemicals i cannot explain it in any frame that i have whatsoever like this is something powerful just happened and i have no idea what to do with it but i accept that i should keep praying and going to church Uh, so I keep doing that, and that, that's where I am now. Unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> that's absolutely beautiful. Uh, so, well, that is, I, I don't know what else to say other than, okay, I, I guess a good question. Is, I'm curious how your wife reacted because I I can I had I had um this conversion experience mm -hmm. while I was at work and yeah. I was listening to the you know, basically I was listening to the scripture mm -hmm. and um <laughs> I came home and uh I I tell her I said I said, and you're never going to believe what happened. And the first thing she says, part of my language, for anybody out there, I don't, she says, did you shit your pants? Did she literally, <laughs> she's like, you, you know, did you, she really thought maybe I shit my pants at work or something. I said, no, I didn't, but, but it's close. Yeah. Like, like, it's like, like, well, it's not close, but it, mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. I can't, something happened. I told her the story about what happened. I was listening to the Bible and I was listening to the story of Legion and, um, and in that moment, Christ captured me and, 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 and brought, brought, and relieved me of all, all of mm -hmm. the, I can't even explain how it happened. Just relieve all of the questions I ever had, poof, gone. They, mm -hmm. they no longer, seem to exist anymore the the questions about uh material validity or any of that stuff just gone it mm -hmm. was just yeah. gone yeah. it was like there was a knowing in my heart it was like no yeah this is obviously the most real thing that could exist i don't mm -hmm. know how to explain that or articulate yeah. and um and then i i um uh, like a week or two later i went to church with my sponsor, I asked because he had been going to church for many, many years. And mm -hmm. he's like, oh, you can come check out my church. And so I went there and 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 I uh when I was there, the pastor was doing a, a sermon on uh Lydia in the book mm -hmm. of Acts. Yeah. And I'm like, oh I knew like it mm -hmm. I knew it was coming. I knew he was gonna ask about the 
to somebody want to, you mm-hmm. know, Lydia had a divine appointment. Somebody here has a divine appointment. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> and so I go up there yeah. and, I, and I get, you know, I, I, I get, um, I get baptized and, uh, and like fully, like there's a big, a big old trough, like mm-hmm. big old trough yeah. that, you know, and, and so then my, I go to my sponsor's house afterwards and he gives me some clothes to bring home or that I can wear some clothes and put my wet clothes in the, in the bag. And I come mm-hmm. home and I said to my wife, I said, you're never going to guess what happened. She says, what did you shit your pants? I said, no, I got baptized. <laughs> And I told him this whole story because, like, you can't ever fully. Uh, you did such a beautiful job of sharing your experience as best you could as to like mm-hmm. what was going on inside you. But there's so many things that you cannot. Yeah, yeah. You know, like when I'm standing in this church, and like there are so many things that are happening right now as it's happening while I'm in that church. Um, that are that God's just pulling this stuff away, pulling it, and pulling away, and, and, mm-hmm. and you can't like. I can't tell you why Lydia, Lydia, it wasn't just that, oh, Lydia got baptized and she had a divine appointment. No, it was like way, 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 way more. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, and um, this is, I think, the importance of willingness to, w- willingness to just surrender. You know, I don't mm-hmm. know, surrender, it's such a, a kind of like this, it, it's kind of like this really, cartoony word it's turned into like many of the words have mm-hmm. turned into these ca- cartoons yeah yeah you know, like surrender the best way i've heard described is you know in in world war ii you know japan surrenders because they know they face extinction basically mm-hmm. yeah and what does surrender look like you you know you take all of the weapons everything that you would ever use to defend yourself all the guns, tanks, and soldiers, all your justifications, and you lay them down, and you 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 stand over there, and you say, "What do I do next?" Right? And mm-hmm. nobody's nobody's happy about surrender. Exactly, it's yeah. happy is the wrong word. It's like, no, I I have no other options. Yeah, and you don't stay the same after you do it. No, right, right. It, it's a continual mm-hmm. deal. Yeah. And so that's why I encourage you, like anybody's listening, like Neil here's great, great story about surrender. You know, this isn't an act of will. Mm-hmm. This is, a, it's a willingness to surrender. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's words are willy nilly there, but. Yeah, yeah, I like, I think that's, it's not an act of will because like at the point of needing to surrender, you don't really have, you are like, your will is in chains to every, like all of your, like all of your sin is like a wrapped up around your will and you can't do anything with your will. Your will isn't yours anymore. You gave it all away. So it's like you, like you, you had to step back and say, I'm, my will is captured, but like uh, something beyond my will has to, like look up mm. and then you realize that like your will wasn't ever in chains like that was like your something else that was something else that was chained up and your will has been free always but you can't see it unless you look up yes well and like the there's like this this parallel of terror and elation Mm-hmm. when it, when that happens like the yes. moment when the moment when christ when i had I, the semester and i was i was captured by christ in this mm-hmm. like wh- when when i was relieved mm-hmm. uh, of of the of the me mm-hmm. i was like it's scary but then it's like oh my god like you're saying you're standing there and like and everybody says that thing and like boom, it's like oh like like at the end of that liturgy where everybody mm-hmm. I can't remember what it was that they said, but they all said say that and you're like I and they're doing the and he offers up the, the Eucharist and you're like, I need to. Like there's that mm-hmm. to me I can I can totally identify. I've never once been in an Orthodox church or had the experience that you're talking about, but mm-hmm. I've had the experience that you're talking about. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I've had similar ones. I one time I stepped into a a, a Catholic church um, in Milwaukee. I was doing a, a tile job. I had been doing the the I had been working on the school portion. It's a very old church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd worked on that school for off and on for a year doing different stuff. And one one job I had, uh, I it was in the church area, mm-hmm. and and I'd never really seen the inside of a Catholic church. And I didn't know. I was just like whatever. I grabbed my tools. It's like five in the morning. I'm walking. The the Abbey Abbey George says we got to go through the the sanctuary here. Follow me. Okay, and, and as soon as I walked in there, I like it was like, what? Yeah, like it was like it was like I can't describe that. It was it it, it took my breath away, mm-hmm. and um, and that was very very I think akin to what we're talking about. I mean, no, I can't I can't will that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and like, and this these matters are far greater than. Then our words could could really describe, or but we try, you know, we try. This is what loving it's that's the priest mm-hmm. coming in and noticing the young man reading the book. Mm-hmm. You know, he's awake to these things. Yeah, and you get to be too. You know, mm-hmm. and I think it's great, and I think that's what all of this this all this silly internet stuff that we're doing. It's 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 the same pattern mm-hmm. trying to be awake to. Because we're seeking, right? What brought yeah. you to peace is you're a seeker. Mm-hmm. You, you desperately need something greater, and and he he knows the best path for each of us. You know, he'll mm-hmm. it, not everybody's going to walk into an Orthodox church or a Catholic church or yeah. or AA or whatever mm-hmm. or the Skinny Jean Church because I know people have the experience there too. Uh, yes, they do. Yeah. And so this is great and and the more that we can share our story the more that we see that we are so much more alike than we are different and we are so much more different than we are alike Mm -hmm. and all of that together makes this beautiful thing that that yeah it's almost like a mosaic vision of reality or something interesting (laughs) mosaic vision yeah Hmm. (laughs) interest i think i've heard that somewhere before um, navigating uh, patterns is that the channel you drop yeah. around here <laughs> I do, I do, I do navigating patterns <laughs> mosaic vision but they talk about the many great patterns to navigate yeah. so many patterns yeah. huge yeah. patterns <laughs> wow so so yeah so what the question is how did your wife yes uh, yeah. she said well I don't think you should ignore that. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we started going, and she was like, "I will, I will go with you." And she hasn't had like that experience, mm-hmm. but like that I know of, like in the same way that I did. But she like feels at home in the church and is like doing things. And part of it is that like my wife never stop believing right like my wife has like always had faith and it you know i didn't (laughs) so (laughs) so what what looks really dramatic for me is just like there's just the straight line like yes ascent which is like in some ways i'm like wouldn't that have been nice? Yes. <laughs> and part of me is like, I love this. Yes. Like, I've had the similar uh, uh, conversation with people at my church because they want to know, well, what happened to you and stuff? And they've been going to church like mm-hmm. for 80 years. And so are their grandparents for 80 years and, and so on. And they'll and I'll tell them the, the story and they'll be like, oh, that's so amazing. I've never had an experience like that. I wish I could have an experience like that. And it's like, yeah, but I kind of wish I had the experience that you had, mm-hmm. you know, and these things aren't in our hands. I don't think if no. they were, we would have, we would have been able to replicate it and mm-hmm. standardize it. And what and good would that be? it. And then you just take your daily experience. Right. 
So, so you do you have did you end up going to have uh, children yet? Yes, I actually have. I, my wife and I have had two children together, and then we are fostering a third. Wow, Mm beautiful. -hmm. Yes, and actually, the, when my first child was born, kind of coincided with like getting really into Jordan Peterson, because there is nothing in the world that will like force you to look at your life and like think about it than having a child. Like it changes. everything about your life if you're doing it right and right even if you're not it will change a lot like you can't really ignore that change right uh, so yeah and wanting to like be plugged into something that like will give my children meaning was kind of important also like you don't I really don't want my kids to do this like U-shaped journey. I would rather them have a nice, Right. you know, ascent. Um, like I don't want them to experience hell on earth. <laughs> I Right. really don't. Uh, so like knowing that I, there's a chance that I could give them Uh, the gift of faith at like an early age was really important uh, in like the, this kicking off the start of my search for meaning. Cause yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, I started out in a church <laughs> and Right. look at me. <laughs> so, I mean, that's does the thing. anything So like, we do like change someone else? I don't know. I think maybe only God can change someone else. right. And I should worry about myself. Yeah, they'll say. Um, uh, one of my one of uh, one of these old timers in AA said, "There's nothing wrong with, with expectations. Just don't be too attached to the results." You know, it's like you know that's pretty good. And the idea is to like hold on to things. wear things like a loose garment, I suppose, you know, um, <clears throat> um, and, and yeah, I mean, cause like, I, I could ask you, like, do you think your father wanted you to have a new shape journey? It's like, no. Right. Because And he had. right. And so it's like, we are not, I don't think that we are necessarily the authors of our story. I mean, I, I don't think we are actually the more, the more I, I sit and I examine that, I think, yeah, there ain't no way. Cause I could, I've, I've often thought, well, what if I had different parents and the conclusion I came to was, oh no, they had almost nothing to do with, with my self-centered, uh, me, me being a self-centered person. Uh, and, and, and. No, I would have been exactly the same, probably, you know, in so many ways. Um, so, so, so great. I'm really glad we had this conversation. I'd like, you know, we should have another one at some point. Yeah, Maybe I'd love that. talk about, but, and you even covered the, the practices. So I imagine you still do it the evening and morning. Yeah, so I'm, I wish I was better at it. Um, but so what, I'll just walk through what I do. Um, in the morning, I'll usually, uh, I will wake up. That's the first step. And then I get dressed and then I'll walk out. I have like a an icon area. It's not a corner, but it's near a corner. It facing the east. And at, at that, there's like a table and some shelves with icons of like uh, Christ and uh, the Theotokos and um, all of my family's saints. Um, and it has like all my prayer books and all my like the Bibles that I read and my Psalter, which is here. The best book in the world, in my opinion. Uh, and I will stand there. Uh, there's an oil lamp that I leave burning all the time. Uh, so I top it off and then light a candle and then I light uh, another candle. And those are like 
I will say some prayer, like whatever, like line from any prayer or psalm that like comes to my mind, I will say as I light each candle. Like I'll say one and then like another one. It might be like, it might just be the Jesus prayer. It might be um, like, there's a ton of short hymns in the Orthodox church that we sing like every single week. I don't know if they're even called hymns. There's just like, like one phrase. <laughs> So sometimes I'll just like sing them. Like I won't sing. I'm so bad. At <laughs> but sometimes I will sing it privately, uh, <laughs> and then I'll uh, say the Lord's Prayer because usually if I'm running late, which I usually am, but I like force myself even when I'm late to at least stand and say the Lord's Prayer. And if I have adequately prepared my time which is a very rare occurrence unfortunately i'll say the whole morning prayers from uh the the prayer book um and some uh, different you know i'm very loose with my prayer rule which maybe is good maybe it's not i don't know but it's what i do and sometimes i'll do uh the prayer of saint ephraim the syrian which is, uh, O Lord and Master of my life, grant me not the spirit of sloth, uh, meddling, lust for power, but grant rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to me, thy servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own sins and not to judge my brother, for thou art holy now and ever into ages of ages. Uh, and like there's like three sections, and you like do a prostration at each, each one. So it's technically it, it, not tech, it's like designed for the Lent season, but yeah. I've just like fallen in love with that yeah. uh, prayer. So sometimes that will be like either in addition to all of the morning prayers or in addition to just the Lord's prayer, or sometimes like I just do that. I don't know. I'm not very consistent in the morning. And then I've been, I take uh, my Psalter Mm -hmm. with me to work i i bake in this coffee shop so oh I do, wonderful i make <laughs> sour i make sourdough breads and uh like scones and cookies and like baked goods for coffee shops um so i come to work and i'll like get work going and then eventually i'll hit like a kind of a stall period where like there's more to do but it's all like resting and like in that resting time, I will read um, from the Psalter. And someday, uh, like I'm trying to get back on track with like reading uh, the way the Orthodox do the Psalter. It's like broken into 20 sections and you can do, um, they're like assigned throughout the week. Um, so I'm trying to like follow that. But other times I'll just like, what song am I reading today? And I read, I'll just like sit there and flip back and forth. Um, I'm, I wish that I could write psalms like that. If I had a goal in life, it would be like, I want to know God in a way where I could write a beautiful psalm that like spoke more truth than I put into it because mm. uh, that's that's how I see it like there's you can you reading the Psalms is experiencing God it, like I I love the Psalms so much mm -hmm. uh, I can I recommend as a practice reading the Psalms you will not regret any minute you spend like reading the songs and the more i read them the more i like learn how to pray because prayer yeah. prayer is about prayer is being in the presence of god and speaking with him and like there's there's levels to that uh and there's you know <laughs> it's difficult 
to like just pray from your heart. Yeah. Like on command. Yes. I often feel like uh like uh what do they call that? It, uh where you um uh I can't remember this stupid phrase where where uh, imposter complex imposter. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like an imposter in prayer. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, another spirit trying to just say, don't do it at all. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I just have to continue to do that regardless of what yeah. I feel mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. So, so then you do this prayers throughout the day or something if they come up or. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'll, the great thing about reading the Psalms is that they're in your brain all day. Like, so I'll just like, ponder on a line that like grabbed me or all like man i wish i had re been able to read this song that i remember and then i'm like oh i can <laughs> and then i'll go read it and like be you know like oh yeah that's right okay <laughs> i don't know how to describe it like yeah. i praying psalms i used to think it was like I'm going to put myself as the author of the psalm and say, this is what I'm saying to God. But that's not really how I experience it. I don't know how to explain how I experience it. Uh, it's just like, it, it feels like a two-way communication and not yeah. like a one-way communication. And I don't know what that means either. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm... I am so trapped in the material world. Like I can't, not in like a Gnostic, myth, a yeah. earth bad, heaven good or whatever. Like that's not what I'm saying. But like I, it's so hard to describe anything with words because all of our words are just like about physical sensation. And <laughs> nothing is about physical sensation except the physical, like, uh hearing god is not hearing words in your ears or even hearing words in your mind most of the time mm -hmm. it's like it's it's not the same as hearing in a, a physical sense not a literal sense a physical sense it's not hearing it's something else it's not it's not even feeling like in a physical like when i say i feel like the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I don't, like, none of this feels it. I don't know what feels it. <laughs> I don't just... know what feels means. When I'm, like, when I'm really praying and speaking with God, most of the time, it's not words, and it's not my mouth. I don't know. I don't, yeah. I cannot describe it. And it's very frustrating. But on the other hand, it's like, maybe trying to describe everything is what got us here to the place <laughs> where we where we can't describe anything is because we've tried to describe things in these like universal like you all get what i'm saying right because we know what feeling and touching and smelling and hearing is but like there's no like next level thinking of on those words like there's yeah. not there's not like baseline hearing with your ears and like upper level hearing with your soul like that doesn't like that doesn't make sense so right. i'm really i'm I've been doing having, yeah i've been having this conversation a lot with uh, a friend of mine about words and like writing specifically because like i'm concerned with writing down things that i think because I have to like translate them out of uh, like, I don't even, I, it's not an, it's not a concept. It's not an idea. It's like this whole thing, like translating it out of God into words. Yes. Like I can't do it. Oh, uh, I had thought last night. I was, my wife and I just watched, um, uh, 
Under the Silver Lake. Mm -hmm. It's a movie. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, and I was like thinking about. We're like, she's like, what? I don't think she really liked it a lot. I'm not sure if I liked it or not either. But um, she was talking about uh, like, what does it even mean? I said, well, what does Alice in Wonderland even mean? Yeah. You know, because it's very much a similar story, mm -hmm. but it's like all the different kinds of stories like Alice in Wonderland or Peter mm -hmm. Pan or all of the dreamlike movies and stories. Mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking about this as I was, I was um, walking. Uh, I went to walk away and, you know, use the restroom or whatever. And on the way of thinking about that, I was thinking of how much I love stories and yet how insufficient they are. Mm hmm. That's the whole the whole project of storytelling. It's not this story, or this story, or that story, or the one that I'm telling myself as I'm going to the grocery store on which mm -hmm. groceries I need to pick up for the dinner that we're going to have tonight. Mm -hmm. It's all of the stories yeah. are the stories, yeah. and yeah. like. The terror of it. I've got, I've got, what? It's like a mosaic of stories. What's that? It's a mosaic of stories. Yes, it is. It is. It and, is. And it all, yeah. And you, but it's fractal, fractally like complex. Like you look at one tile in the mosaic and it's a whole mosaic and all the way down. And like yeah. words are most like, like insanely complex. Yes. Words are crazy yes it's magical that we can use words mm -hmm. this is like I, just, I don't i don't know how to do anything like i don't know what i don't know what's going i can't describe things i can't i'm just i just am that's what i've i'm trying to just be and hope that that's okay yeah <laughs> that's why understanding is is even that itself is not a great a great word to describe understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, like, and this is where I think we we have a word like imagination, mm -hmm. but it's reduced down to this word yeah. imagination, which is yes. absolutely nothing to do with imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I kind of have a a beef with the word imagination, uh, because it. Now, it's probably just me, but like when I and when I am imagining, I'm like constructing. I'm like in constructing, tinkering mode, and I'm like uh, building something in my brain. Is how I experience like imagination. But I I I would like it to be more like receiving like the story that you do, mm -hmm. but that's not just not what I I don't know I don't know. Maybe See, I just have, maybe I just, I just have beef with myself, which right. I'm sure I do. Um, beef is probably the wrong. Everything's the wrong word. Right. <laughs> I, and I get I get so stuck in this mode of like that's not the right word. That's not the right word. Right. That's not. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's that's another spirit, right? Yes. This, that spirit to 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 manage and control. Mm -hmm. Uh, part of it is driven by a love because that's what show and tell is. Oh, mm -hmm. I found this thing. I think you would love it. I want to show it to you. I have this desire to share mm -hmm. this glorious thing. And then, you know, and then we use all these words to try to to give like a, 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 a disclaimer. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of like flattens it. I think this is mm -hmm. what I did with the sleep token band. I went around and told her. I, I actually prepared for this by listening to a ton of sleep token. And I... Oh. I think that I get what you're saying, but I can't say it, so I won't because I don't want to like ruin what you're trying to say or what they're trying to say. But right. I think I think I'm getting something, but I don't know what it is. So the, I'll just I, jump on. I'll jump on with you and say something is there. Yeah. Whatever. I don't. And, and beyond that, I don't know. Yeah. Well, they're doing this. I think that's what they're playing with. Is mm -hmm. this? Is this? There's actually no information out there about what it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's all speculative. Yeah, I looked. I looked for it. Right. And so every, everything is speculative. And then, like, um, so that's what I think is interesting about them. Mm -hmm. But the, the, that's the topic of what I'm saying here. It's like, um, there's something so much more about, like, oh, it's the idea of the, 
what does the banana taste like? I can't even describe what that is, right? Like you could spend a lifetime trying to do that. And, and, and like, it, it's, it's, it will never be sufficient exactly in the way that you would hope it would be. And that's the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I get to spend the rest of my life trying to, or not even trying, because I think you're going to, you, 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 you're constantly in the, in the, in your life, tasting the spiritual life, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't realize this, yeah. you know? And so, yeah. yeah yes. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. I've been, uh, miracles. I think everyone thinks about them. Not everyone. I think a lot of people think about, I think I thought about them wrong. That I'll say right. it that way. Just cause, yeah. so I don't, <laughs> That's a good way maybe to say I'm it. the only one who thought this, but I always imagined it as like, a discreet like actions mm -hmm. like god stepped in here and did something and then that was <laughs> a miracle and then that was a miracle but it's really just like everything's a miracle <laughs> everything yeah. everything is a miracle uh and then you just like sometimes you like see that it's a miracle mm -hmm. because like we have this like narrative going on and i think this we like construct a world that we live in like we don't we don't experience reality really we experience our uh, our construction of reality inside of yeah. ourselves um and like we have the story of reality and like every once in a while something comes along that we can't fit into the story that we're telling ourselves but someone else might be able to someone else can be like oh that i can explain that easily with this story like here right. take this story and integrate it into your story of reality uh but really like it's the the story is God is doing yeah all miracles all the time the, we, glory glory yes. glory yes glory all of that mm -hmm. it's yes. it's the, it's the standing there while the priest holds up the Eucharist mm -hmm. and says this thing and you're like oh my gosh mm -hmm. I've never what a miracle and your mm -hmm. wife is like yeah I mean that's great you should probably follow that <laughs> yeah. you know and, and like that's the the I mean, the fact, the miracle, uh, the, I think the one of the most, some of the most um, massive miracles that we completely don't ever, ever, almost never recognize is, I am saying the word miracle. Mm -hmm. I can say the word miracle and know what it means to a degree. You can hear it and understand it, but I'm, speech is a miracle. Mm -hmm. Like nothing else is speaking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As far as we know, right? I mean, mm -hmm. all of this stuff is is complete miracles, and just because they're so abundant, I mean, uh, it's like you're living in a in a in, in, a, in like this um, arena full of miracles all the time, all the time. You're mm -hmm. just like whatever, but like the one miracle is like there's a purple banana. That's weird. Mm -hmm. What is a purple banana? That's a miracle. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. So unbelievable, great. This is really good conversation. I don't even know how long we've been going for. Yeah, I don't even. But it's great. It's been an absolutely stunning conversation, and I'm I'm so grateful that that you reached out, and I hope that we get to do it again. We could. I'm sure there's so much stuff we could talk about. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> um. Wow, I'm just blown away. Um, but I, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, you, um, you as well. And um, you have my phone number now. I sent it mm -hmm. to you. Call yep. me any, text me anytime, whatever. And I am so grateful, Neil. And yeah. uh, and uh, I don't know how to end this thing, but thank God for this strange experience uh, that that He has laid out for all of us so that we can cross paths. This is wonderful. Amen. Amen. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.